Breezes blew on into the night, and the moon shone white on the tremulous lava below, lighting their voyage. Hugging the coastline, they passed the land where Circe, daughter of the sun, lived in Othrin. The woodland rang with a perpetual song, and in her high house she burned fragrant cedar to illumine the night while she worked the loom, combing her shrill shuttle through delicate threads. And from those shores could also be heard lions roaring and snapping at their chains late into the night, the raging of bristled boars and caged bears and huge wolf shapes howling. All these were men whom Circe had cruelly drugged and clad in the hides and faces of beasts. But Neptune, to save the good Trojans from these monstrous transformations, kept them from landing on those deadly shores filling their sails with wind and bearing them past the seething shoals and out of danger. Now the sea was reddening, and dawn saffron in her rosy chariot shone in the sky. When the winds fell and every breeze died down, as the oars struggled in the smooth marble water, Aeneas, still far offshore, looked out and saw a vast forest, and flowing through it the beautiful Tiber, its current swirling with golden sand as it broke into the sea, above and all about birds of many kinds that haunted the banks and bed of the river flew through the woods, enchanting the air with their trilling. Aeneas ordered his men to change course and turn their prows landward, and with joy he drew into the shady river. And now, Erato, who were the kings, and what was the state of ancient Latium, when this foreign army landed in Italy? Help me, goddess, your sacred poet, recall the prelude to the hostilities, for I will tell of war's horror, of pitched battle, heroes driven by courage to meet their doom, of Etruscan squadrons, and all Hesperia pressed into arms. A higher order of things opens before me, a greater work now begins. King Latinus, old and gray, ruled over lands and cities through a long twilight of peace. He was born, we are told, from Faunus and the Laurentine nymph Marica. Faunus's father was Picus, and Picus looked to you, Saturn, as his father. You were the founder of the royal line. Latinus's son, his sole male heir, was gone, torn away by fate in the springtime of youth. He had only a daughter to keep his great house, a daughter ripe for marriage, a bride-to-be, courted by many in broad Latium, by many from all Ausonia, and the handsomest of all was Turnus. He was from old blood, powerful, and Latinus's queen was strangely passionate to join him to herself as her son in marriage. But portents from the gods warned otherwise. A sacred laurel stood in the inner courtyard of the palace, tended in awe for many years. Latinus himself is said to have found this tree when he first built the citadel. He dedicated its foliage to Phoebus Apollo, and from its name called his people the Laurentines. A thick swarm of bees buzzing and humming through the crystal air settled in the top of this tree. And, a sign and a wonder, hung with feet interlaced from the highest branch, a sudden hive. At once the seer cries, I see an outlander, troops arriving from the same direction as these bees, seeking and mastering the citadel. And again, while Lavinia at her father's side kindled the altar with a hallowed torch, her long hair, to everyone's horror, caught fire. Flames crackled in her headdress, her jeweled tiara flared with heat, and the princess herself, shrouded in glowing yellow smoke, scattered Vulcan sparks throughout the palace. This ghastly miracle was reported widely and taken to mean that the princess's future was bright, but that a great war would come upon her people. The king was troubled by these portents and consulted the oracle of Faunus. His prophetic father, the Vatic grove beneath High Albunia, a great forest that echoes with the sound of a sacred spring and breathes mephitic vapors from its shadows. The people of Italy and all Onotria came to consult this oracle in time of doubt. It is here the priest brings his offerings, and when he has lain down to sleep upon the fleeces of slaughtered sheep, 
In the still of the night, he sees many phantoms flitting about in strange ways, hears many voices, converses with the gods, and speaks to Acheron in Avernus's depths. Father Latinus came to consult this oracle. He slaughtered a hundred yearling sheep in ritual order and lay himself down cushioned by their holy fleece, their woolly fleece. Suddenly, a voice came from deep within the grove. Seek not, my son, to marry your daughter into a Latin family. Trust not a wedding already prepared. A stranger will come to be your son-in-law. His blood will exalt our name to the stars. And his children's children will see the world turn under their feet, and their rule will stretch over all that the sun looks down upon from sea to shining sea. Thus the response of Father Faunus, his warning given in the dead of night. And Latinus did not keep it a secret. Rumor took flight, and had already spread the news through all the cities of Ausonia, when the men of Laomedon's Troy were mooring their ships to the Tiber's grassy banks. Aeneas and his captains and fair Aeolus reclined in the shade of a towering tree, and spread out a feast on the grass below. Heaping fruits of the field, Jupiter himself gave them this notion, on wheat, flat bread, to supplement the meal. When they had eaten everything else, their appetites drove them to break the scored, fateful rounds into sections, and sink their teeth into the crusty bread. We're so hungry, we're even eating our tables. Aeolus said this in jest and said no more, but Aeneas heard it as the first sign that their trials were ending. Awestruck, he seized upon his son's words and cried, Hail to the promised land and faithful gods of Troy, here is our home. This is our country. My father Anchises foretold this to me. I remember it now, one of the fate's secrets. When you are born, my son, to shores unknown, and hunger compels you to eat your tables, then, in your weariness, hope for a home. Build your first houses there. Roof them well with your own hands and bank them with mounds. This was that hunger, the final stretch of all our misfortunes. Come then, be happy. With the sun's first light, we will explore these lands, find out who lives here, locate their city. We will fan out from the harbor. For now, though, pour libations to Jove, pray to Anchises, and set the wine again on the tables. Aeneas spoke and wreathed his temples with leaves. Then he prayed to the places in dwelling spirit, and to earth first of the gods, and to nymphs and rivers yet unknown, then to night and night's wheeling constellations, to Jove of Ida and the Phrygian mother, and his two parents, one in heaven, one in Erebus below. And at his prayer the Father Almighty sent three peals of thunder from a clear sky set in the ether, a cloud glowing with shafts of gold, and shook the cloud with his own great hand. Word spread quickly through the Trojan ranks that the day had come for them to found their promised city. They outdo each other to renew the feast, and cheered by the great omen, fill the bowls with wine to the breaded brims. Dawn touched the sky with her early light, and Aeneas and his men fanned out to reconnoiter the exact location of the city, its borders and coasts. Some found the pool of Numicia's spring, others the Tiber, and still others Labinium, home of the brave Latins. Aeneas ordered a hundred ambassadors from every rank to go to the king's majestic city, all of them shaded with olive branches, to offer gifts and beg peace for the Trojans. They strode off quickly on their mission, and Aeneas marked off walls for his city with a shallow trench and started building, encircling this first settlement on the coast with the ramped stockades of an army camp. Now the envoys could make out the rooftops of Latinus's city. Outside the walls, young men and boys in life's early bloom were breaking in horses, riding them hard on the dusty plain, or practicing archery, hurling javelins, squaring off to box, or running foot races. When galloping up, a messenger brought word to the aged king that a great company had arrived, huge men in strange dress. The king ordered them in and took his seat upon his ancestral throne. Stately, immense, column upon column, Latinus's palace crowned the whole city. Once the palace of Laurentine Picus, it bristled with groves and religious awe. Here it was auspicious for kings to receive their scepters and first lift the facies. This shrine was their senate. Here they hold holy feasts. 
And here, after the slaughter of rams, the elders sat at long rows of tables. Their ancestors' images, carved in cedar, lined the walls. Aged Saturn, Italus, and Father Sabinus, who first planted the vine, pictured holding his long pruning hook, and double-faced Janus, all of them standing in the vestibule. And there were other kings from the early days, and heroes who had suffered wounds while defending the fatherland, and many arms were hung from the sacred doors, chariots taken in war, curved axes, helmet crests, massive bars of gates, javelins and shields, and beaks wrenched from ships. And there, too, sat a figure holding the Quirinal staff in his robes of office, his left hand wielding a sacred shield. This was Picus, breaker of horses. His love-struck bride, Circe, later struck him with her rod of gold, and with poisonous drugs transformed him into a bird of colorful plumage. It was into this temple of the gods that Latinus, seated on his ancestral throne, summoned the Teucrians, and as they entered, welcomed them in calm and measured tones. Sons of Dardanus, for we do know your race and your city, and have heard of your sea voyage. Tell us, why have you come? What purpose or need has borne you over so many dark blue seas to the shores of Ausonia? Whether you lost your bearings or storm winds blew you off course, as often happens to those who sail the high seas, and so entered our river, do not refuse our hospitality. Know that the Latins are Saturn's race, a people just not by laws or constraints, but of their own free will, keeping the ways of their ancient god. And I seem to recall... Though time has dimmed the old Aruncan tale, how Dardanus was born in this land and went from here to Phrygian Ida and to Samothrace. It was from here he came, from the Tyrrhenian town of Corthus, and now he sits in the golden palace of the starry sky, while here on earth there is one more altar to the gods above. And Ilionius, in response to Latinus, My lord, illustrious heir of Faunus, no black storm has driven us here to seek shelter in your land, nor has star or coastline deceived us. We have come to your city on purpose, with willing hearts, exiled from a realm once the mightiest the sun has seen from the circle of sky. Our race is from Jove. The sons of Dardanus glory in Jove as their forebear. Our king himself is of Jove's highest race, Trojan Aeneas, who sent us to you. How fierce was the storm that swept from Mycenae over Ida's plains! How the worlds of Europe and Asia clashed, and fateful conflict has been heard the world over! From the farthest shore laughed by ocean and the farthest region of the globe's five zones, served from us by the tropical sun. From that deluge we have sailed the barren seas, and now we ask a safe strip of shore, a little land for the gods of our country, and water and air that are common to all. We will hardly be ashamed to your realm, nor shall you be lightly praised, nor shall gratitude for such a deed grow dim, nor shall Ausonia ever regret taking Troy to her breast. By the fortunes of Aeneas I swear, and by his right hand steadfast in loyalty and mighty when tested in war, that many nations, many peoples have sought alliance with us. Do not hold us in scorn because we come with garlands in our hands and words of entreaty. The fateful decrees of the gods in heaven have driven us to seek your shores. Dardanus came from here. Apollo calls us back and urges us on to Tuscan Tiber and Numicia's sacred springs. Further, Aeneas offered to you these tokens of our former fortune, rescued from Troy as it burned. With this gold, his father Anchises poured libation at the altars. These Priam bore when he decreed laws to the nations, scepter, sacred tiara, and royal robes that were the work of the women of Troy. Ilionius finished and at his words, Latinus held his face downward, reflecting deeply. It was not Priam's embroidered purple robes or his scepter that moved the king. His thoughts were on his daughter and her marriage as he brooded over Faunus's ancient oracle.
This, he thought, must be the foreigner whom the fates have destined to be my son in marriage and to share my power equally. His descendants will excel in virtue and rule the world with might. At last, in joy, he spoke. May the gods favor what we enter upon in their own prophecy. You shall have what you ask for, Trojan, and I do not spurn your gifts. While Latinus is king, you shall not lack rich fields or the wealth you had at Ilium. However, if Aeneas is eager for this alliance, let him come himself and not shrink from friendly eyes. My condition for peace is that I have touched your master's hand. Now take this message back to your lord. Tell him I have a daughter, whom oracles from my ancestral shrine and countless signs from heaven do not allow me to marry to any of our race. It is Latium's destiny that a son-in-law will come from foreign shores, and that his blood will exalt us to the stars. It is my belief that he is the chosen one, and if I augur true, it is my desire. And the old king picked out horses from the three hundred in his stable and ordered them to be led forth, one for each of the two Creans, horses swift of foot and caparisoned with embroidered purple. Golden chains hung below their chests, their saddle cloths were gold, and gold the bits they champed. For absent Aeneas he chose a chariot and a matched pair of fire-breathing horses, reared by Circe, daughter of the sun who had stolen one of her father's stallions and mated it with a mortal mare. And so Aeneas's men rode back to him high on the mounts, bearing gifts and words of peace from Latinus. But now Jupiter's ferocious wife was returning from Argos, striding the level air, when she saw from afar all the way from Sicilian Pacinus Aeneas, his spirits high with all his people. They were already building a city. At home on the land, their ships empty. She stopped in mid-air, pierced with grief, and shaking her head, poured forth these words. Ah, hated race! Phrygian fates at odds with mine! Couldn't they have died on the Sigean plain? Defeated? Couldn't they have endured defeat? Didn't burning Troy cremate these men? No, they found a way through fire and foe. My divinity must be wearing thin, or I have grown content, my wrath appeased. Not exactly. When they were thrown out of their country, I persecuted the outcasts all over the deep blue sea. All the powers of sea and sky have been used against them. But what did the Surtees get me? or Scylla, or gaping Charybdis. They have found shelter in Tiber's long-sought channel, safe from the sea, and safe from me. Mars could destroy the giant Lapith race. The father of the gods sacrificed Caledon to Diana's wrath. But what did the Lapiths or Caledon do to deserve such punishment? But I, Jove's great consort, who have left nothing undared, have tried every trick in turn, am bested by Aeneas. But if my powers are not great enough, why should I hesitate to seek help from any source whatever? If I cannot sway heaven, I will awaken hell. I concede Aeneas the rule of Latium, and Lavinia is his bride by iron fate. But to draw it out and delay the issue, that I may do and destroy both nations. Their people's lives will be the price for father and son-in-law to form a union. Trojan and Rutulian blood will be your dowry, bride of Aeneas and Bellona your matron of honor. It was not only Hecuba who conceived a firebrand and gave birth to nuptial flames. Venus's own child is a second Paris, a funeral torch for new Troy. With these words, Juno descended to earth, a terrifying presence, and called forth Electo from the home of the dread goddess in the shadows below, gruesome Electo, whose heart is set on war and wrath, intrigues, and crime. She is hateful even to Pluto, who sired her, hateful to her Tartarian sisters. So many shapes she assumes, so cruel her faces, so vile, the black vipers that sprout from her scalp. Juno inflamed her with words such as these. 
Daughter of night, grant me a favor, a special service that will preserve my honor. Prevent Aeneas from winning over Latinus through marriage or from invading Italy. You are able to make like-minded brothers arm for battle, to overturn homes with hate, to bring lash and funeral torch to the earth. You have a thousand names, a thousand ways to cause harm. Ransack your teeming heart. Shatter the peace. Sow the seeds of war. Make each man want to grip a weapon, demand one, and seize one all in one breath. And so, Alecto, venomous as any Gorgon, makes for Latinus's place in Latium, and occupies the still threshold of Amata. The queen was inside, seething with a woman's fury at the Teucrians' coming, and sick at heart over Turnus's marriage. The goddess plucks a snake from her dark hair and throws it on Amata, thrusting it deep into her bosom to drive her mad, and so bring down the entire house. Gliding between her clothes and smooth breasts, it insinuates itself unseen and unfelt by the frenzied woman and hisses into her its viperous breath. The huge serpent becomes the twisted gold around her neck, becomes the long band about her brows, entwines itself into her hair, and slithers down her limbs. As the first taint of the poison is absorbed, assailing her senses and inflaming her bones, but not yet engulfing her soul in fire. Softly, as mothers do, she murmurs, weeping over her daughter's wedlock with Aeneas. Will you give Lavinia to Teucrian exiles, you, her father? Have you no pity left for your daughter or yourself, no pity for her mother, whom this traitor will desert, with the first north wind sailing away with our girl as plunder? Wasn't this how Paris entered Lacedaemon and bore off Helen to Ilium? What of your solemn promise? What of your old love for your own? What of your hand so often pledged to Turnus, your kinsman? If it has been decided that we need a son-in-law of foreign stock. If the words of your father Faunus are so important, then I maintain that every land not under our rule is a foreign land. And the gods agree. Turnus himself, if you trace his lineage, is descended from Inachus and Acrisius with roots in Mycenae, the heart of Greece. Amata's words had no effect on Latinus. When she saw her husband standing against her, and when the venom had infected her deeply, pulsing through her veins, the ill-starred queen was swept away by monstrous horrors and raged in her frenzy all through the city. A top kept spinning by a twisted cord as boys intent on their game drive it along in great loops through an empty courtyard will whip around curve after curve as the throng of entranced children hovers above it, mesmerized by the whirling boxwood toy. Likewise, Amata, driven through the cities of the fierce Latian peoples and through the forests, feigning the spirit of Bacchus a greater sin, and reaching new heights of madness. She hid her daughter in the wooded mountains to forestall her wedding to the Teucrians, shrieking, Hail, Bacchus! You alone are worthy of her! She waves the thyrsus for you, worships you in the dance. Grow her sacred tresses for you, Bacchus! Rumor spreads, inflaming the Latian mothers with fury, and they rise as one, abandoning their homes, hair streaming in the wind, as they fill the air with their quavering cries, dressed in fawn skins and carrying spears entwined with vines. The frenzied queen lifts up a blazing torch of pine and sings a wedding song for her daughter and Turnus, rolling her bloodshot eyes and suddenly shouting, Hear me, mothers of Latium, wherever you are, if your hearts are still loyal to unhappy Amata, if you still care about her and a mother's rights, unbind your hair with me and celebrate the revels. Such was the queen, driven by Electo, with bucket goads through the haunts of wild beasts. Such was the queen, when the dark goddess thought she had put a fine enough edge on the first shafts of frenzy and had undone Latinus 
and all his house, she flew on dusky wings to the walls of the bold Rutulian city. The story is told that Danae, driven ashore by the strong south wind, built this city with her Acrisian settlers. Ardea, it was called, and the great name remains, but the place is desolate now. Midnight and Turnus was asleep in his high palace. Alecto sloughed off her fiend's body and changed herself into an old woman. She creased her brow, made her hair white, and bound it with wool and an olive chaplet. She was Calibi now, aged priestess of the Temple of Juno, and with these words she offered herself to the young hero's eyes. Turnus, will you allow all your work to be washed away and the scepter handed to these Dardanian settlers? The king denies you the bride you won with your blood, and a stranger is sought as heir to your throne. Go ahead, face danger unrewarded, you fool. Smash Teucrian Tuscan ranks. Shield the Latins with peace. Saturn's almighty daughter in person told me to tell you this while you lay abed in the still of the night. Up then, smile, arm your lads, march them through the gates into the fields, and burn the painted Phrygian ships lying at anchor in our beautiful river. Heaven commands it, and unless King Latinus honors his word and gives you your bride, let him feel the full force of Turnus as foe. And Turnus, mocking the seer, so a fleet has entered the Tiber's mouth, and you think I don't know? Don't invent a crisis for my benefit. Queen Juno does not forget me. Old age has rotted your mind, and deludes your prophetic soul with false alarms. See to the gods' temples and statues. War is the work of the men who wage it. Alecto's hair spread out in fiery points, and as Turnus spoke, a sudden spasm seized his limbs. He stared in horror at the furies hissing snakes in the face that loomed before him. Her eyes rolled in flame as she pushed him back. Turnus stumbled, tried to say more, but the fury pulled a pair of snakes from her hair, cracked her whip, and spoke again from her rabid lips. Behold me, mind rotted with old age, prophetic soul deluded with false alarms. Look on this. I come from the dread sisters, and in my hand I bear war and death. And she threw a torch at the young hero, sticking it in his chest, where it smoked with black light. Turnus woke in terror, sweat pouring down, drenching him to the bone. He called madly for arms, groped wildly in the bed for weapons, lusting for steel and the rut of battle, rage crowning all. A fire crackling under her bronze cauldron heats the water until it seethes and bubbles, unable to contain itself, and a cloud of dark steam rises into the air, and so Turnus... Peace be damned, ordered his captains to march on Latinus. His battle cry rang out. For Italy, drive the enemy out. Turnus is here, a match for Teucrians and Latins alike. And he called on the gods to witness his vows. The Rutulians outdid each other in the call to arms. Stirred by Turnus's good looks, his high lineage, and his prowess in battle, second to none. While Turnus seethed, the Rutulians' hearts, Electo was flying on shadowy wings to the Trojan camp, surveying the region with new wiles in mind. There on the shore, Aeolus was hunting with horses, nets, and a pack of dogs. The dark goddess threw the hounds into a sudden frenzy and touched their nostrils with a familiar scent that sent them off in pursuit of a stag. This was the first cause of war in the countryside. There was a stag of surpassing beauty with towering antlers that had been torn from its mother's breast and raised by Tyrus and his children. Tyrus was the keeper of the king's herds and far-flung pastures. His daughter Sylvia had trained the animal and would lovingly twine its antlers with flowers, comb its coat, and bathe it in a spring. Tame and used to eating from its master's table, it would wander the woods but always come back to the door it knew, however late at night. The stag had wandered far from home, and, having swum downstream, was cooling off on the green river bank when Aeolus's dog started it running. Ascanius himself, eager for glory, aimed an arrow from his curving bow, and the goddess steadied his trembling hand. 
The reedy shaft whistled through the air and pierced the stag's belly and flank. The wounded animal fled to its familiar home and dragged itself all bloody into its stall, and its moans filled the house like the cries of a supplant. Sylvia, the sister, slapping her arms in fear, called for help from the hardy country folk, who came instantly, prompted by the fiend, lurking in the silent woods. They were armed with burnt-out torches, knotted clubs, whatever came to hand, wrath turned into a weapon. Tyrus, who was splitting oak with wedges, called to his men as he snatched up an axe, his breath coming in huge gulps of rage. But the cruel goddess, watching for the moment she could do the most harm, scaled the rooftop and sounded the shepherd's call, her hellish voice blaring through the twisted horn. All the groves quivered with fear, and the woods echoed to their very depths. Trivia's lake heard the sound from afar. White Nar heard it in his sulfurous water, and the springs of Villinus. Fearful mothers clasped their sons to their breasts, but their husbands, unruly farmers, quickened their pace at the trumpeted signal, snatching up weapons as they ran in from all sides, and from their camps opened gates. The Trojans poured out to help Ascanius. The battle lines formed. This was no longer a country quarrel, fought with stakes and clubs, but combat with sharp steel. The field bristled with a dark crop of drawn swords, and flaring bronze reflected the sunlight up to the clouds. The first wave begins to whiten in wind, and then the swells rise higher and higher until they arch from the seafloor up to the stars. An arrow whined through the foremost ranks and hit the firstborn of Tyrus's sons, young Almo, full in the throat, blood choking speech and breath. He lay in the dust, and around him lay many bodies of men. Old Galasus, among them, cut down as he threw himself between the two lines, pleading for peace. He was of all men the most just, and once the wealthiest in all Ausonia. Five flocks of sheep bleated in his fields, five herds of cattle returned from his pastures, and his soil was turned over by a hundred plows. So the battle raged across the whole plain. Alecto's promise was fulfilled. Blood had been spilled in battle, deaths inflicted. She left Hesperia and turned through the sky to address Juno in triumphant tones. I have crowned discord with grim war, as you wished. Tell them to unite in friendship now that I have painted the Trojans with Ausonian blood. And more, if I am assured of your intention, I will draw the bordering towns with rumors and inflame their minds with battle lust. War will spread. I will sow the field with arms. And Juno answered her. Enough of treachery and terror. The causes of war are in place. They are fighting man to man, and the weapons chance first gave are now stained with fresh blood. This is the wedding they must celebrate. Venus's perfect son and great king Latinus. The lord of Olympus would not approve of your roaming too freely in the upper air. Leave these regions. I will deal myself with whatever troubles remain. Thus Juno, daughter of Saturn. Serpents hissed in Electo's wings as she spread them wide, leaving the world above for her home in Cocytus, a river of wailing in the underworld. There is a place in the heart of Italy, beneath towering mountains, the famed Vale of Amsanctus. Dark woods surround it, and a stream roars through its center, spilling over rocks and swirling in eddies. Here can be seen a dread cavern and fissures through which the Dark Lord breathes, and a vast gorge that belches out Acheron. Here the fury disappeared, relieving heaven and earth of her abhorrent presence. Now Juno put the finishing touches on her nascent war. A company of shepherds poured into the city from the battlefield, bearing the dead, the boy Almo and Galasius's mangled body. They called on the gods and held Latinus to account. Turnus was there, and amid the riot, the passions, and the shouts of murder, he multiplied their terror. Teucrians are called in to rule. We are becoming Phrygian half-breeds, and I am shut out. The Bacchic women were still in their frenzy, mothers dancing through the trackless woods. The name of Amata carried some weight, and now their men were coming together from all sides, wearying Mars with their pleas. Defying the omens and the sacred oracles, their minds twisted. They all clamored for an unholy war. 
Latinus's palace was soon besieged by an ugly crowd. He stood as a cliff stands on an ocean shore, motionless as a cliff in the crashing ocean. Its sheer bulk holds steady as the sea below howls and roars in the foaming crags, and it flings back the seaweed that strikes its face. But when he saw that he was powerless to change their blind resolve, that all was going as cruel Juno wished, old Latinus called the gods and the empty air to witness. We are being broken by fate, swept away by the storm. You will pay for this in sorrow with your sacrilegious blood. You, Turnus, you will suffer punishment severe. Too late will you supplicate the gods with vows. As for me, my rest is won, but at the gate of the harbor I am robbed of a happy death. Saying no more, Latinus shut himself in the palace and dropped the reins of power. There was a custom in ancient Latium, held sacred later by the Alban cities, and now by Rome most high, whenever Mars is first roused, be it the Gete or Arabs or Hyrcanians, against whom they prepare to bring the tears of war, or to march on India, pursue the dawn, and reclaim their eagles from the Parthians. There are twin gates of war, so men call them, sanctified by faith and fear of Mars, held shut by a hundred bronze bolts and the eternal strength of iron. Janus, their guardian, never leaves the threshold. Here, when the fathers declare war, the consul, wearing quirinal robes and a toga with cabine cincture, unbars the grating doors and calls forth war. The rest of the army then takes up the war cry, and brass horns blare in hoarse accord. Latinus was charged to declare war on Aeneas, and in just this way, and open the grim gates. But the old man would not touch them, recoiling, recoiling from such service, and hid himself in shadows. It was the queen of the gods gliding down from the sky, who with her own hand pushed the hesitant doors on their turning hinges, and burst open the iron-bound gates of war. Now all Osonia was in burning motion. Some were starting to cross the plain on foot, others rode out furiously on war horses, raising clouds of dust, all lusted for weapons. You could see men burnishing shields, polishing spears, and wetting axes on stones, glad to bear standards and hear the trumpets call. Five great cities started to forge new weapons, mighty Atina, high Tiber, and Ardea, Crustumeri, and turreted Antibne. They molded helmets, framed shields in wicker, hammered bronze into breastplates, and crafted smooth greaves of pliant silver. They beat their plowshares into swords and re-tempered the swords of their fathers. The trumpet sounds, the password goes around, signaling war. A man anxiously snatches a helmet from his home. Another harnesses his trembling horses, puts on his golden, triple-linked armor, and straps on his sword. Now open the gates of Helicon, goddesses, and lift my song. Who were the kings incited to war, and the fighting men who filled the plain? With what heroes did sweet mother Italy even then bloom? With what armies did she burn? For you know, divine ones, you can remember and tell, while we hear only the whisper of fame. First into war came the fierce Etruscan, Mezentius, scorner of the gods, and he marshaled his troops. At his side stood his son Lausus, in glory of youth, second only to Turnus. Lausus, breaker of horses, led into battle a thousand men from Agila's town, who followed him in vain, a son worthy of a father better than Mezentius. Next came Aventinus, handsome son of handsome Hercules, his chariot and prize-winning horses on parade in the fields of glory, and on his shield his father's insignia, a hundred serpents surrounding the hydra. The priestess Rhea gave birth to him in the Aventines woods, bringing him secretly into the world of light, a woman who lay with a god. Hercules, having slain Geryon, had just arrived at the Laurentian fields and was watering his Iberian cattle in the Tuscan stream. Aventinus's men bore javelins and great battle spikes, pikes while he himself marched on foot, a huge lion skin swinging from his shoulders, its white teeth crowning his head. This was how Aventinus would enter the hall, an unnerving sight, bristling with the cloak of Hercules. 
Next, the twins Catullus and Chorus, brave Argives, came from Tiber, named after their brother, Tibertus. They worked their way to the front lines through a forest of weapons, like cloud-borne centaurs racing down a mountain, leaving Homol or snowy Orthus behind, the woods parting before them as they crashed through the thickets. There, too, was Caecolus, Prenestes founder, the king, as every age has believed, born to Vulcan among rustic herds and found on the hearth. With him marches a vast militia drafted in the field, warriors from steep Prenesti, from the farms of Juno who guards the Gabi, from the cool Aenio and Hernica's rocks, and men whom you feed, rich Anagnia, and you, Amesinus. Not all of these have weapons or shields or clanging chariots. Most of them fight by slinging lead pellets. Some carry two spears and wear wolfskin helmets. Their left foot is bare, the right protected by a rawhide boot. Mesopus, breaker of horses, son of Neptune, whom none may lay low with fire or steel, calls to battle sedentary tribes, troops long idle, and once again grips a sword himself. These are men of Phasenium and of Aqui Felici from Soractes Heights and the fields of Flaxenia near Simonus' lake and the groves of Capena. They all marched to the beat and chanted praise to their king. Snowy swans, high in the misty air, on their way back from feeding, issue melodious cries from their outstretched throats, and the sounds echoes from the Asian wetlands far below. No one would think that bronze troops were massing here, but that vast clouds of raucous birds were pressing toward shore. Next comes Clausus, of old Sabine blood, leading a great army, and equal in stature to a great army himself ancestor of the Claudian clans that spread through Latium after Rome was given in part to the Sabines. With him marched Amaternum's troops and the ancient Quirites, the whole band of Aretrum and of olive-bearing Matusca, citizens of Nomentum and the inhabitants of the Rosian country around Vellini, and those who live on the cliffs of Tetrica and Mount Severus, in Casperia, and Foruli, and by the river Himela, those who drink the Tiber and Faberis, those sent from cold Nursia, Ortine troops, the Latin peoples, and those whom Alia, name of ill omen, parts with its waters. Multitudinous as the foaming waves that roll on the Libyan sea, when Orion sinks into the wintry water, or as dense as wheat scorched by the sun in Hermes's plain, or in the golden field of Lycia. Shields clang, earth trembles under tramping feet. Next, Halasus, son of Agamemnon, Troy's nemesis, yokes horses to his chariot, leading a thousand warlike tribes in Turnus's cause, men who hoe the wine-rich Massic country, men whom their Aruncan fathers sent from the high hills and the Cidicene plains, men from Callis and the Volturnus's shallows, marching alongside tough Satic, and Oscan bands. They were armed with smooth javelins, their shafts entwined with throwing thongs. Shields protected their left sides. Their sickled swords were for close combat. Nor will you, O Ballas, pass by unsung. The nymph Sebethus bore you to Telon when he was king of Teleboan, Capre, and already old. But not content with his ancestral fields, his son even then extended his rule over the Sarastrians and Sarnus Valley. Rufre, Batulum, and Kelemna's fields were men where men throw spears in Teuton style, and all those under the walls of Abella, rich in apples. Their headgear is made from cork, but their shields flash bronze, and bronze flash their swords. Mountainous Nurse sent you also to war, noble Euphens, a good man with a spear, and from a tough breed of men raised on Equia's rocky soil and inured to hard days of hunting in the woods. They work the land in arms, and all their joy is to bear away spoils and live on plunder. Archippus, lord of Maruvians, sent a priest to war, helmet wreathed in olive, 
Umbro, most brave, who could charm to sleep vipers and hydras with their venomous breath and cure their bites, but he could not heal the bites inflicted by Dardanian spears, nor did his entrancements or herbs called on Marcian hills aid him with his wounds. For you wept, and Gitia's grove, for you the glassy wave of Fucunus, Fucinus, for you the clear lakes. Verbius too went to war, Hippolytus's beautiful son, sent forth by his mother, Aresia. He had grown up in Agaria on the marshy shores, where Diana's altar stands rich in sacrifice. Hippolytus had been undone by his stepmother's wiles and paid the price to his father in blood, ripped apart by his own frightened horses. But he was called back to heaven's air under the stars by the healer's herbs and Diana's love. Then the Almighty vexed that a mortal should rise from the shades to the light of life, blasted the healer, son of Phoebus, to the waters of Styx. But Diana in mercy hid Hippolytus and sent him away to the nymph Egeria and her sacred grove to live out his days there in the woods of Italy, alone and unknown under the name of Verbius. This is why horses are banned from Diana's temples and groves. Panicked by a sea monster, they strewed youth and chariot along the shore. Still his son was pushing his fiery stallions along the plain, driving his chariot to war. In the foremost ranks moved Turnus himself, incomparable, sword in hand, head crowned with a plumed helmet bearing a chimera that breathed from her jaws Aetnian fire. Flames all the more fierce, the more blood is shed. On his polished shield, Eo, horns uplifted, an emblem blazoned in gold. Eo, covered in bristles, already a heifer. With Argus, her warden and her father, Inachus, pouring his stream from a figured urn. A cloud of foot soldiers followed him, and shielded columns crowned the plain. Argive troops and Aronkin platoons, Rutulians and veteran Sicanians, lines of Sarcanians and Labysians with painted shields, tillers of your glades, O Tiber, and the sacred shore of Numucius, Numicius, farmers from the Rutulian hills and Circe's ridge, whose fields are ruled by Jupiter, Angser, and by Veronia. Gay in her greenwood, where the black swamp of Satyra lies, and the cold Euphens winds through the valley and down to the sea. Last of all rode Camilla, the Volskian, leader, leading her mounted troops and squadrons flowering in bronze. This princess warrior had not trained her hands to women's work, spinning and weaving, but trained to endure the hardships of war and to outrun the wind. She could sprint over a field of wheat and not even bruise the tender ears, could cruise over the open sea's waves and never wet the soles of her feet. All the young men and their mothers, too, flocked from their houses and left their fields to watch her ride by, mouths open in wonder at how the royal purple draped her smooth shoulders, how her hair was bound in gold, and how she carried a Lycian quiver and an iron-tipped spear. <laughs>